And now I'd like to let David Smith from Texas A&M um, talk about uh, continuous response measurement. Thanks, David. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, appreciate you sticking around. And we're drawing close to the end. Uh, I'm going to talk about a tool that's used to evaluate, or that can be used to evaluate some of our uh, educational material. Actually, not evaluate, but it can be most useful if it's to pre-evaluate what we, especially uh, videos or presentations, before we actually roll it out to a larger audience. So it's called continuous response measurement. It's also called dial testing. And uh, it's a tool that's used a lot in politics. Uh, you'll see this tool used um, quite a bit around the election season in smoke focus group sessions. I know that you turn on uh, Fox News, they they have a person that's doing this you know, all every day, it seems like. But the uh, purpose of this presentation is, is to evaluate or assess the effectiveness of one of the videos that Pam just referenced uh, on mitigation. Uh, we had uh, a video that was produced that with the intent of that video was to include it in uh, this online course. And uh, I had an opportunity in this last year to uh, actually image, to show that video in its entirety uh, to a group of uh, extension uh, educators and NRCS folks uh, at a venue that we had that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so that we could get that feedback from them on, on, on this, uh, this product. Uh, my uh, co-author, uh, Dr. Saki Bukhar, is here. He's the Associate Dean and that program leader for the University of Florida Extension. He uh, was the PI, I'm, I'm in the southwest region of this project, and he had, was the PI for four out of the six years of, of the project. And so he was involved in this as well. I won't go too much into the background of the project. Uh, Pam did a good job of explaining what, what we're all about. Uh, I'll just say that uh, in the southwest region, we had eight states that primarily were responsible for Providing this education to the objective was to encourage livestock production practices that are environmentally sound, climatically compatible, and economically viable. So that was the intent of the project. In the south, of course, the, our focus, focus was mainly on beef production, both pasture and feedlot. So the producers in our region, that was our focus throughout really the entire year of the project. Uh, the project there started in 2011. Uh, initially for five years, and we did get a one-year extension, and so uh, we just finished up with that project. We we tried a lot of different approaches uh, to educate the extension agents and the technical service providers in our region uh, through face-to-face -face workshops. Here in the Southwest region, we had four uh, workshops over over uh, six years, and uh, I will say that. Uh, with this particular itch subject in our region, it was a hard sell to get extension agents to show up to a climate a related event. And I will say that uh, we were fortunate to have funding so that we could coerce uh, <laughs> agents and the supervisors into attending. And really, that's if we didn't do that, if we didn't have the funding to support their travel, then we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. And so that's something to think, think about as you starting up the project really declining. And it's, you know, it's been six years, but still the attitude is just sort of there uh, with the extension. Um, I'm going to talk about continuous response measurement. Um, and the purpose really of this was to demonstrate we had a, a venue or a workshop uh, last fall, and we showed this video, and we were going to use this technology as a tool to assess the perception from our extension agents and how they felt about uh, the particular mitigation video. Um, uh, we also, in addition to doing this activity, we followed this up with uh, a focus group discussion and also a survey instrument. And the results of everything that I'm going to show you today, the, the, result, the results of that in further detail going to be included in a journal of extension article that we just submitted yesterday. And so hopefully that will, will go through uh, uh, and we'll be able to we'll have more detail on this to 
Uh, Greg, so we, uh, you did take, you did participate in this activity too. So if you have any comments at the end of the presentation, you're welcome. Uh, the venue, we had a, call it, Cattle and Climate Conversations Workshop. It was held in Denver uh, last fall. Uh, we had 61 workshop participants. Uh, those represented, that were both Extension, um, NRCS, and, and a few more uh, just in the Colorado vicinity uh, with the state government. Uh, 34 of those uh, were consisted of NRCS Extension educators, and that's really the, the, the target audience with this, this uh, video. So that's how many participated in the, uh, in the activity. The video itself is, again, the intent of this was to uh, be a video that was included on the, in this online course. So it was a little longer. It was 32 minutes long, and, and it was fairly comprehensive, and it was intended to be that way. Uh, you know, if we would have, this would have been intended for the public or something, of course we would divide that into smaller segments and without that one. So I'll say that up front. It was produced by David Schmidt, the University of Minnesota, who I believe is here today. Uh, and then also he uh, uh, used the funding to hire a, a video producer, uh, Jules Gessler. So we we'll give her credit for that too. Uh, she's been in this business for a long time. So the, the video itself is, is uh, the production quality is pretty high uh, for an extension video. So uh, basically the content, uh, we discussed global and national agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. It sort of started out in that context. Uh, provided some arguments for and against greenhouse gas mitigation. So it did, did throw out there some of the arguments for and against because this particular issue, mitigation, is generally one of the most contentious among the, the, the extension uh, audiences uh, because there's, uh, you know, it, there's regulation involved in talking about uh, those issues. Relative greenhouse gas emissions among animal species and production practices. So it covered, you know, poultry, pork, dairy, beef, and different types of production practices. So it was kind of fairly comprehensive in nature. Um, a lot of the footage uh, included greenhouse gas mitigation uh, strategies, so it included a lot of on-farm footage and some of the mitigation technologies that were already in place. And then finally, it included a, a lot of interviews with, uh, with experts uh, in the field of climate science, uh, animal agriculture, but also interviews with some of the farmers. So they included a lot of different aspects of things that we wanted to kind of gauge the perception uh, of, uh, and get some feedback from the uh, extension educators. Because, you know, the point of this is to kind of get them to talk to their producers about some of these issues. And so this was, we felt would be a good measure of how well this product would be received. So when we started out, um, we, uh, in the Southwest region, we hired uh, a couple of folks from Texas Tech University, Coy uh, Callison and Glenn Cummins, who was with the College of uh, Media and Communications here at Texas Tech University. And they had, uh, they had been doing some of this uh, uh, dial testing uh, on different water, uh, different water groups, but they never had done this uh, in front of you know, with the, uh, the climate topic, the climate issues. So they were interested in, in doing this. So basically they led this activity. We, uh, we there was about 34 combined uh, extension and an NRCS people there. So that's the ones that we wanted to target with this activity. So they were provided dials, handheld dials, and then uh, basically they provided a brief ex explanation of where to start and then how to adjust uh, continuously. Um, it started at a mid-range setting at 50. So this dial had a setting, a digital setting of 0 to 100. So that was the range. And they were instructed to start at 50. And then they were to adjust their dial up or down continuously to rate their agreement with a particular stick. And this is really the important part if you're going to be doing this. Is what, are you, what are you gauging? What question are they reacting to? And so we felt that in this litigation video, this is the question to be asked. 
for the statement. This is effective at encouraging adoption of mitigation techniques. So that was the ultimate goal. So did the, did the participants feel that the messages that they were receiving in this video uh, were effective in that regard? Uh, and so the responses range again from zero, which strongly disagree, to 100, which they strongly agree. And so video is shown in two 16-minute sections. So it was a fairly long video. You sit there and do this, you know, for 30 minutes. So we divided it up into two different segments and played uh, at different areas, different times of the day. Uh, the responses, the response rate, was, the sampling rate was once per second, and so it was fairly instantaneous. And so it, well, we, they were able to correlate that with the video footage and, and show some of the, uh, the findings. So I'm going to present four of the key findings that. We, we got out of this activity not only the data that we got, but also um, this includes some of the, the focus group discussion and some of the uh, survey results as well. And again, more of that will be in the journal books into paper. Okay, so what, what did they like? Okay, they showed a preference for actionable insights in real world applications. That doesn't surprise us, probably. Um, but when you're doing, a, when you're involved in producing a product like this, and in video, you can get sort of uh, uh, thinking outside of you, thinking in your own world, and you sort of lose that connection uh, or intent. <coughs> so I think it's important to, to just show this. They preferred enumerated presentation of specific greenhouse gas mitigation techniques of benefits. So whenever we had a footage come up and we had text we showed bulleted points uh, that were relevant uh, to, the, to them, then that's where the files <coughs> went up and they showed the most agreement with. Uh, so a little bit on the left is a little bit difficult to see here, but this is the overlay, the video is playing in the back. This is the statement that they're reacting to. And again, this is effective at encouraging adoption and mitigation techniques. And then overlay is the, the screen uh, that shows the, the results, continuous results of the dialogue. Here on the left axis, we see this is the scale of 10%. This is in percentage, actually. So it goes to 0 to 100. And the little white bars show the percentage of that those audience members that were fell into these categories on you know, the level of agreement. So we started out here, and remember the mid range is 50. So all of the participants rated this at this point in the video in positive way. They showed an agreement with that. There was no 100%. And then we're showing a, a graph, continuous uh, line graphs here, which shows that for the uptick and the downticks. Okay. And then on the right here, it's, it breaks it down into, we have 34 total participants, seven of those were in RTS, uh, 22 were extension, and we have five others. And so you can look at the graphs, and sometimes it's, a, you know, it's interesting to see how these divert. So basically that's uh, uh, one of the findings, uh, real world application of green greenhouse gas uh, technologies. Again, we had uh, several points in the videos where we had footage overlaid with uh, bulleted lists talking about, uh, you know, the points. And this one particular one is not just oxide emissions from soil and uh, just short points. Uh, speed conversion efficiency, uh, just uh, best management practices there. And you can see that, you know, the lines are going up and in both of those, all of the participants uh, showed positive responses in these. Uh, whenever you had on-farm footage, got five minutes left, on-farm footage, uh, that was always uh, correlated with strong responses, so wherever you can include those. Uh, here it is, uh, on-farm technology, actual farm footage, you see the uptick. Uh, whenever there is uh, interviews of producers or advisors out in the field, they correlated with a uh, positive reaction. You can see this was very high. Whenever they did the video with the uh, footage with the farmers in the interviews, that's where their dream was very high. Uh, others with farm footage and, and not farm uh, mitigation technologies. Um, two, preference for peer information sources. Uh, participants rated short interviews with academics throughout the video as least useful. 
And, and we had uh, probably six or seven interviews during that 30 minute video, and it was consistent. Whenever we had footage of an expert sitting in a chair doing an interview, that's where the, uh, it, it was the most negative. And the participants suggested, and this is uh, information taken from the focus group discussion afterwards, uh, suggested that the speakers featured in the video offered redundant information. So it could be that point, not necessarily the expert that's talking, but they were providing information that's already been discussed. You know, that could have been why. A post survey asked, who would be the best spokesperson to talk about greenhouse gas and aquaculture? You know, eight percent said farm. We want the farm, we want to hear the farmer, someone that's in this agricultural producer talk about this. And so we will feel more comfortable with that. 13% scientists and 6% others. Uh, so a couple of the comments, overall focus should be more on the producers and other research and talking in your offices. So that was a statement that came in afterwards in the, in the survey. Best folks person are honest, authentic producers. Anyway, number three, it's like the trucks and graphics. We had several points in the video where we had charts and graphics, and uh, some of those were difficult to read, uh, and some of those were complicated. And so just as noted, the negative response elements with global or international focus. The very first slide that came up in this video was from the uh, IPC, uh, CC, uh, and you see where this point is. There was no positives, <laughs> and most of it was negative. So this was not a very good way to start the conversation. Uh, and so information was too broad and diverse to be locally useful. We had, again, this was to be a comprehensive video intended for a specific audience, but they felt that uh, in a lot of cases it wasn't specific to their situation. <laughs> These were some of the, uh, the graphics that we did bring up, and you could see whenever these were, were brought up, you saw it on the other Need uh, for greater tailoring and alternate presentation forms. Uh, you know, the good point, they, they said distribute this in multiple five minute segments. Okay. Uh, focus on specific topics. So rather than be comprehensive, make sure it's very specific to the uh, type of animal you're talking about and the type of production practice. So it needs to be very that specific for them to be comfortable with it. Uh, Preferred means for sharing information. Uh, rather than it being in video, 61% felt that in-person presentations for groups were most effective or they were most comfortable with. 39% uh, said one-on-one -on -one presentations to farmers. And you can see we talked about social media, websites. Uh, that was their least preferred method of communicating. So some of the takeaways from this I think that we can, this can be a useful tool uh, if you're in the uh, beginning stages of producing materials on a project such as this, to evaluate what your message is. You're not, you know, maybe, that, uh, maybe it's not your, uh, your content, maybe it's the way you're presenting uh, and how it's being received. And that if, if they're not receiving it, then they're not gonna take that message on to others and produce it. So that's, a, that's important. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to do this, this is fairly expensive. Um, we, you know, this costs us around three thousand or so to do it, uh, uh, this activity for this audience. They're limited to thirty-four dials. They said we can get more dials. It'll be one hundred and twenty dollars a piece. So if you're going to do this with a large group, I prefer to you know, suggest that you break that group into smaller ones and, and show it in smaller groups. And, uh, we're going to have a, a long video, break that up into uh, the different parts, as many as you can get away with. And don't do this like we did. Yeah, I did this at the amount of time. But at the end of the afternoon, don't do this in the afternoon, do this in the morning. When everybody's fresh, you know, and uh, you're not retired. So uh, I'll be happy to answer. You have, you have one question? Uh, one minute. We have a minute. Okay. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay. So I saw some percentages. I'm curious, does the technology give you any like correlation coefficient or any statistics? How yeah, they did do some statistics on this and they were able to define a zero. Basically they defined anything that was a significant uh, moment was uh, 
two standard deviations from the average. So they're able to do some statistics on this, and we have that information in the paper. Any other questions for David? Did you get any comments on the colors? No, but we didn't ask. I'm sure that we would have if we had asked about the appearance and the colors of some. That, that was brought up in some of the discussions, actually. So a lot of the times when the charts were up there and they had too much information, you started seeing some negatives. I mean, I know that was one of the things we really turned the dial down for. And colors as far as people's clothing. I know there was an issue with one of the Pattern of clothing, color of clothing. Yeah, one of the researchers, the reason the researchers ended up getting such a low score most of the time was, one, they were in an office and not, you know, out on the farm. But I heard a couple of comments from other people that they didn't like the clothing color choices of the people. That was your point, you asked. I was just wondering where along with the, I saw the slides and I think you need the text or the picture. Speaking of color, you might bear in mind that about 5 to 10 percent of males are colorblind, including myself. And those red pointers, these are hardly visible. And very quickly, some of these participants are also producers themselves. So you're training the trainers who are ranchers and producers. Majority of them, correct. Well, let's thank David for a great presentation.